Good afternoon. My name is Peter Sharoshi and welcome from the Vienna International Center where we are sitting at the uh, Commission on Narcotic Drugs uh, 65th, 61st session. And uh, today we will uh, discuss uh, stigma and how stigma affects uh, the lives of uh, people who use drugs and what this uh, meeting can do about this problem. So let's start with, 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 with what, what words we should use because uh, that's I think it's one of the key issues uh, that somehow it defines who we are, what words we use about people. And uh, one of the terms I think which is kind of controversial is, uh, is the term addiction and addict. So can you tell me, Judy, like uh, uh, why uh, the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, we are the executive director of, uh, opposes the term of to use addicts? Um, sure. Well, the International Network of People Who Use Drugs um, have always had a problem with the addiction model and the language of disease, the language of addiction, which implies disease and the implication of a disordered um, loss of control, like this compulsion. So I think when you associate, you know, drug use and people who use drugs with addiction, um, you apply that language and implies that we have no control over our lives that it's impossible to regulate or manage drug use, which is not true. There are many who do. Um, so I think, you know, we need to look at other words that we can use that don't increase the stigma of people who use drugs and imply that, you know, we cannot make decisions about our own lives or we lack agency or autonomy. So I think, you know, it's important discussion to, br to bring, you know, in addiction, it's not just about health, it's not about disease, there are so many factors that we really need to look at and I think we miss out a lot on reducing reducing drug use um, to a disease model, to just a health framework. Uh, and what do you think about uh, addiction itself? Uh, because some people say it's a disease, some people say it's a moral failure, some others say, think that that's just a social phenomena. So Sean, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, my opinion is that uh, the term addiction, if you're going to use it at all, has to be wider than drug use. And we've seen some researchers like Bruce Alexander talk about addiction in its various forms. My problem comes when we use the term addict as a noun um, and we describe somebody as an addict because that comes with a whole set of presuppositions and ideas with it. Uh, in terms of, uh, of addiction, I certainly don't think it's a disease. I think it's part of the human condition. Um, we've seen a concerted effort by various uh, international bodies to promote addiction as a disease under the guise of uh, decreasing stigma. In fact, you know, I, I, always, I always say, would you have somebody who's got uh, perhaps uh, some sort of uh, bad habit around your house, or would you rather have somebody who's been labeled as having some serious mental health disorder? You know, and, and that question usually shows that, that there's not reduced uh, stigma. Of course, there's a lot of stigma, and there's a lot of stigma around mental health disorders, which shouldn't be there either. But to claim that the disease model reduces stigma, I think is just uh, disingenuous. I don't think it's an intelligent uh, argument at all. I think that it gives an excuse for paternalism, for uh, putting people into coerced treatment or enforced treatment. And I think that, that there are a number of problems with it. But most of all, I don't think there's scientific data to support it. The brain changes we see in so-called addiction are not that different to any other brain changes we see, and the brain changes, that's the way it works. So uh, now I have a problem with, with the pathologization of addiction. Thank you, and um, actually there are some governments who try to do something about uh, stigma at this meeting, uh, including Canada, uh, who uh, submitted a, a draft resolution on, on language and, and uh, destigmatization of drug users, and we have Donald McPherson from Canada here. So, Donald, can you explain us what is this resolution about? Well, the gov government of Canada has put forward a resolution on uh, stigma, and they're very committed to working towards reducing the stigma uh, on uh, on that is society puts on an institutional institutional uh, settings put on uh, people who use drugs. Um, and it's fascinating after after listening to to uh, you two uh, the the it, what's playing out in the debate about the resolution it's all about language, and uh, what's really interesting and I think it's really exciting at this time uh, 
the language is shifting. And the language has been stuck for a hundred years at least. So, so this resolution, which I think was put forward in good faith by uh, Canada, uh, it had some very good wording in it. It's become the, a focal point f uh, for exposing the debate on the old stuck UN language that talks about drug abuse, talks about drug abusers, and more uh, current contemporary language around uh, problematic drug use, people who use drugs, uh, the various words that are being used for addiction now, with substance use disorder, drug dependency, addiction still gets used. So it's actually a really exciting time, I think, in our field because there is, language is critically important and the language is shifting. And the resolution from Canada was an attempt to uh, acknowledge the, how, how stigmatizing uh, concepts and language were uh, to people who use drugs and created such barriers to all sorts of uh, activities in the, in the community. So um, I think now that this resolution has gone forward, the language discussion is on and uh, I don't think it's going to go away. Do we see uh, much opposition to this uh, resolution and, and who is opposing this? Yeah, th there's a significant amount of opposition to this resolution and a country with very fundamentalist views of, uh, w of what addiction is, of uh, punitive approaches, of uh, people who use drugs need to be uh, sort of separated from society, sort of treated. Uh, um, pe children and then youth have to be protected from drugs as if drugs have agency, as if drugs are going to come into their bedroom at night and uh, infect them or something. It, it's, it's a very, very old-fashioned, uh, non-evidence-based, uh, fear-based view of drugs when in fact much of the discussion in the CND, drugs are not the problem. Uh, social conditions are the problem, uh, socioeconomic conditions, uh, uh, com lack of community, disconnection from community, those are the problems. But this forum in particular focuses on drugs as a problem, which is unfortunate and it would be great if we could get beyond that and maybe through this language discussion we can begin to open up some of those, uh, uh, some of those uh, perspectives that, that uh, it, this is so much more about other things than drugs and we have to get beyond that. So the, the UN also has been discussing the issue of standardization of treatment and uh, creating international standards for drug treatment and maybe the idea is not, not very bad in itself but uh, the, the, UN, uh, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime and the WHO came out with a document this year on international standards and many organizations including uh, input representing drug users is against uh, that document. Can you tell me wha what's the problem with that? Um, sure, so input, um, you know, we put input into these guidelines and then we were able to, with other partners, uh, mobilize 188 civil society organizations. And the issue wasn't the principles of the treatment guidelines. Um, we agree with developing these guidelines and I think the intention was to, you know, really define what treatment is and that it's not, it shouldn't be compulsory. You know, some of the things that are happening in the name of drug treatment um, are, you know, t are torturous, um, they're cruel, uh, degrading in human treatment so we definitely agree that these guidelines are needed but the problems that we had with these guidelines was again some of the stigmatizing language um, you know they were supposed to be evidence-based and based on ethical standards um, but again I think you know sometimes the intention behind things and the you know um, maybe not looking at language enough and looking at models that we've gotten used to using such as the brain disease model that are non-evidence based increase stigma and you know falling into this idea that you know people who are drug dependent are not good employers are um, not fit for parenting you know these are some of the you know some of the language that we really need to start changing so that was one of the issues a second issue was um, not using the terms harm reduction because it is very, um, 
you know, political, not some member states have a problem with it, but we wanted to point out that th these are supposed to be technical guidance. It shouldn't be, um, you know, subject to political biases. Um, so that was another issue that we had with it. And also, you know, broadening out harm reduction to look at, you know, safe injecting facilities and heroin assisted treatment. Um, also, we thought that some of the guidelines weren't aligned with previous, you know, technical guidance. So the WHO, um, technical guidance on key populations, the injecting drug use implementation tool, obviously the comprehensive package that do mention harm reduction. Um, and thirdly, a major problem we had with it also was the process. So any WH document is supposed to go through a grade review, review process, um, which is also supposed to involve community and have meaningful community input. Because at the end of the day, these are the treatment guidelines that are going to impact our lives. We know that they're um, the intended authorship or for, I guess, primary audience, sorry, it, uh, treatment providers, but at the end of the day it affects our lives, so, you know, we should be meaningfully involved in reviewing the guidelines. Yes, I think I, I come more from a from a, a clinical kind of background on, on this, and I think that, and a data background, and some of the basic problems I have with it is, is in particular in the background section, there's no referencing, and, and there's a lot of uh, statements there that, that are just not true. There's no data to support them. And then even in the, in the treatment uh, guidelines, there's the promotion of short-term treatment, detoxification, without mentioning the risk of detoxification for certain people, you know, particularly uh, opioid-dependent people. Um, there's uh, the promotion of um, residential rehab, uh, which there is not a single study anywhere in the world that shows that traditional models of residential rehab outperform spontaneous remission rates in substance use disorders. Not one study, anywhere. Uh, and certainly no well-controlled studies. And, uh, you know, this is promoted. And it shouldn't be in, in, in a document that's supposed to be a scientific document. On top of that, a lot of the language is problematic, as, as Judy has, has mentioned as well. But I think it's, uh, it's almost a, it, it's, it's a document with multiple personalities. And we can see uh, in certain areas, for example, in the brief interventions and the, um, uh, the, this, you know, the, that section on, on, on sort of more motivational approaches and brief interventions and, and screening, uh, the World Health Organization has referred to their assist tool, which is, is not a bad tool, you know. But in other portions of the document, it, it talks about the, the lifelong nature of substance uh, use disorders or the chronicity of them. It compares them to other uh, health conditions, which there are very few comparisons with. And we know from the data that the majority of substance use disorders, if you want to use that criteria, they resolve, and they resolve spontaneously without treatment. That's not acknowledged anywhere in this document whatsoever. And, and that, to me, is just unscientific and not clinical good practice. Oh, uh, just to say a few things. Again, uh, um, I don't have as much expertise as Judy and Sean in this area, but uh, we're, coming, we're coming out of the dark ages, uh, not only on language, but only on thinking about what addiction is, what treatment is, and lapsing to the most expensive uh, you know, residential treatment models that's, that cover the fewest individuals in a society is, is a, it, it's very expensive kinds of treatment. So. Um, there are, you know, there are psychedelic therapies that are being developed uh, with psilocybin, with MDMA, with LSD that are, you know, now being looked at for certain types of, uh, of conditions, including addiction. So uh, it, it's actually quite an exciting time, but the doors have to open to new ways of thinking about what this phenomenon is. It's a really complex phenomenon. Treatment is, 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 it works for some. It's a complex process, and uh, we have to, we have to, that the document should be way better than it is, given the state of knowledge. If they had have had a really comprehensive uh, group of people looking at that, they could have come up with a much better document. But again, they lapsed to sort of the same old, same old way of thinking, and that's what the document tends to reflect. Judy, you mentioned abuse in the name of treatment, so uh, can you tell us what kind of abusive forms of treatment and rehabs are around the world? Sure. And what um, can we do about it? <laughs> That's a difficult question. Um, so, I mean, you know, some of the abuses that do happen in the name of treatment 
Um, there are compulsory drug detention centres, the government run. Um, they're very prolific or used quite very widely in Asia. Um, particularly in China in terms of the numbers. I believe there's between like 200,000 to 500,000 people in compulsory drug detention. Um, what happens in there, you know, people are picked up by the police. They're put in these detention centres for anywhere up to six years. So some of, you know, being detained in the name of treatment is sometimes a longer uh, sentence than being detained in prison. Um, so we assume that, you know, when things happen under the rubric of health or the, you know, regulatory powers of health, sometimes Sometimes they're less, uh, we assume that they're less um, abusive, but that's not necessarily true. And then within these centres, not only is there deprivation, deprivation of liberty, liberty, but there's also been physical and sexual abuse, um, you know, lack of, uh, say, treatment services for HIV, Hep C, uh, military drills. So this whole gamut of um, interventions that happen under the name of treatment but I think you know also um, there's this growing trend towards that there's you know in um, Latin America there's these in, in Nepal there's private um, privately run rehab and they happen under the name of rehabilitation and unfortunately these type of measures get more funding and financing than you know harm reduction approaches and you know evidence-based approaches um, so you know, that's something that's hugely problematic with treatment and compulsory treatment. So, you know, we can't put, we can't just assume that treatment or the health framework is necessarily always a good thing. We always need to be interrogating, you know, what's happening underneath that. Tom, you are from uh, South Africa. So uh, can you tell us the situation there? Or, uh, like, are there also abusive forms of treatment and are there evidence-based programs available? So um, South Africa has had a long history with uh, struggling with terms around harm reduction, for example. We've had an extensive lobby against the term harm reduction. Organizations such as Doctors for Life have uh, had enough political power to stop us using the accepted definitions of harm reduction. And so uh, our last National Drug Master Plan had the description of a localized version of harm reduction that focused purely on treatment. Uh, of people who, who were using drugs and the presumption that all people who use drugs uh, were doing so in a way that, that required treatment, which just wasn't true. Um, it's delayed the, the rollout of uh, opioid substitution therapies or opioid agonist therapies, as I prefer to call them. Um, it's delayed the, out, uh, the rollout of needle and syringe programs uh, with the result that in certain cities we've got a prevalence of hepatitis C of up to 93%, 40 plus percent of HIV prevalence amongst people who inject drugs, uh, and all of this is preventable. Um, fortunately, the South African uh, policy landscape is changing. Uh, for the first time ever last year, we had consultations between our central drug authority and uh, people who, most, who are most impacted by drug policy in South Africa. We are seeing the uh, World Health Organization basket of services, as in their technical guidelines, being introduced. Um, we still have a, a battle ahead of us because, for example, methadone is up to 30 times more expensive in South Africa and it's only available in the private sector for those that can afford it. But uh, we've had some successes in rolling out low threshold programs and we've got one of the cities to fund a low threshold program, which is proving very, very successful. So we're hopeful that, uh, that it, the situation is going to change. But where we do have a lot of abuse is in the criminal justice system. So people who get arrested for uh, possession of drugs do not get any legal aid whatsoever. They get automatically remanded or forced to sign a, an admission of guilt, which gives them a criminal record for the rest of their life, making them virtually unemployable for most sec formal sectors of the economy. And, and that's a form of subjugation of people. And one of the points that I try and make is that in South Africa, we've taken the resources that were used to police apartheid and, and we've taken those resources and put them into the war on drugs. And so we've got the military in being uh, used uh, as, as an intervention in certain areas. We've got a lot of police action. We've got, uh, you know, stop and searches. And, and a lot of people are ending up in jail, you know, because they simply happen to be in possession of a small amount of drugs for personal use. And uh, that becomes the perfect recruiting ground for gangsters, and it increases the levels of marginalization and social exclusion, which drives drug use, as we know. So the, the so-called solution is becoming the problem.
we activists are often criticized that we are always criticizing, but uh, we, 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 we rarely uh, speak about the ideal world, which or the ideal system which we, we, we envision. So my last round of question to all of you is that how would that ideal world look like and how would, uh, how would, how, how would be people who use drugs treated in, in, an, in an ideal world? And, uh, and drugs, how, how, would, how would the governments treat drugs? Well, it's, in, it's, 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 it's complicated, but it's really not. Uh, in an ideal world, drugs would be regulated. Uh, we go through a process. W that's what we do, eh? We regulate drugs. We regulate hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of drugs, except for a, f a very few that creates this huge market, uh, underground market, where the substances are full of toxins and you can't count on what you're getting and all that sort of stuff. So ideally, we would and that that is a major problem it, it, it has to happen and Canada is a good example right now we are having lots of harm reduction expanding treatment um, but it's not keeping up to the fact that the drug supply under prohibition is absolutely toxic that is the key driver of the overdose crisis in Canada so if people were using regulated drugs there may be some overdoses there may be some problems for sure but it there would not be the level of overdose deaths that we're seeing. So to me, all the treatment, all the harm reduction in the world is not going to solve the problem if, if people are ingesting things that will kill them they don't know the quality of. So we have to start there. And, and of course we need good harm reduction, good treatment, good prevention, all that sort of stuff. But if, if people have to lapse to a toxic illegal market to get their supply of drugs, they're they're really uh, it, it's 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 hopeless. Sorry to be so uh, <laughs> so hopeless. I, I I hate using that word. <laughs> Judy. Um, no, I mean we definitely agree with you know the need to move towards regulation. Um, I'll just focus a bit more on the stigma and discrimination part. Um, I do think, you know, in terms of drug use, it really has to be normalised, and the fact that we don't normalise it creates increasing stigma and discrimination so this vicious cycle of more marginalization which you know drives problems in people's lives um, and I think you know we really have to start to realize that simply people have always used drugs and the you know these global architectures we use to control it has only happened in very recent times um, you know opiate use in China was very normalized for hundreds of years and there wasn't you know the level of problems until there was Western you know intervention kind of in that but Yes, I think, you know, we really need to start shifting our attitudes. And yes, some people need, you know, assistance and access to medical services and social service, just as everybody does. And we all should have a right to that. Um, but I don't think we need to focus on, you know, drug use as the problem. Yes. Um, I've got two end points that I'd like to see. The first is a world where people are most of the time able to make conscious, informed decisions about the way in which they use drugs, when they use drugs, and which drugs they choose to use in a policy landscape that doesn't make those drugs more harmful or less beneficial. That's the first one. The second one is I'd like to see a world where drug policy isn't used as an excuse for the continued marginalization of people and exclusion of people, and where the marginalization and exclusion of people doesn't make drug use the most salient uh, option or the most important uh, or the most meaningful option for people who use drugs, where, where they're able to participate fully in society. And as a final point, I'd like to say, we cannot achieve any of this as long as we've got the words evil linked to addiction and to drug use as they are in the single conventions. Uh, while we've got that language there, we cannot hope to have a, a, a constructive drug policy landscape because it's like building a house on a cesspool. It's going to sink. Um, and I don't think I need to say more than that, but but really, it, it, it's a big problem for me. Thank you very much for joining me. And thank you for those who, who watched us.